Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for inviting us to uh, be part of this session. This is just such a wonderful conference. Um, and so this uh, session is on retinoblastoma and vision. And I would like to first start off by introducing the panel for the session. Myself, I'm going to start off with a short talk followed by Stefania Morrow, who is a postdoctoral fellow at York University. She's going to talk about hearing and retinoblastoma, followed by Esther Gonzalez, who is a professor at the University of Toronto. And she's going to talk about um, interacting with the visual world. Then we are going to hear from Sarah Johnson, who is a professor and scientist as well at Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago. But today she's joining us as a, a patient survivor providing her uh, experience to share with the rest of us. And finally, our co-chair, Michelle Ongaro, is going to close the session with his experience with retinoblastoma. Okay, so I am just going to very briefly, since uh, we are short for time, I am going to talk about vision following the long-term loss of one eye. So as you all know, the human brain is not fully developed at birth and the you know, infant is maturing in so many ways and part of it is physiological and the brain is actually maturing and becoming more and more adult-like over many, many years. So as a result, because the brain isn't mature, the development of the visual system is vulnerable if there is a loss of vision um, during the early years while it's maturing. And there are many common forms of childhood visual disruption. And so I've put up a picture here of a, a cataract and that's uh, another form of disruption to the visual system. Um, having a misaligned eye, which is uh, also called strabismus, can be another way that the visual system can be disrupted um, after birth. And research looking into these types of um, disruptions to vision as a child have shown that there are various adverse long-term outcomes on vision. And some of it can be just in, the ter in terms of acuity and um, your ability to see in 3D or stereo vision. But what I wanna talk about today is the loss of one eye from unilateral eye nucleation. And the story that I want to tell you in this brief few minutes is that unilateral eye nucleation is different from these other forms of visual deprivation. And so in my lab over the last um, 15 years that I've had my own lab, but before uh, when I was a graduate student, I did some work with Dr. Marty Steinbeck and uh, so it's been about 25 years for me that I've been looking at the loss of one eye and how it affects vision. And we've looked at a number of different forms of visual outcomes. And um, so I've listed some of them here. So visual acuity, that's just like looking at, a, at an uh, eye chart in your doctor's office. Sensitivity to contrast, being able to see light and dark details. We've looked at how people perceive texture, how your vision is in the periphery, how we perceive motion, how we perceive faces and scenes. But today I'm just gonna cover the top two here that I've bolded just for brevity to try and um, be expeditious. And so what I'm telling you about today, the participants uh, who have kindly participated in research in my lab, we've tested people as adults. So we're looking at the long-term effects. So over 18 um, to at even older, people who have undergone unilateral eye nucleation. And as you know, it's typically quite early in life um, after birth up to typically about two years of age. And as you know, it can be either eye. And we always compare our patient participants with controls, binocular viewing controls, who are age matched. And so they can be binocular viewing with both eyes open. 
And sometimes we compare them to controls when they have an eye patch over one eye so that we can simulate what vision is like with one eye. So as I said, I wanted to talk about how um, vision is different with unilateral eye nucleation. And so what I'm showing you is called a contrast sensitivity function. And it's really just a general um, cartoon here showing you the general ability of, that we're able to see when uh, we're looking at light and dark patterns. And um, so this graphic here shows you from low to high contrast. So um, light versus um, very dark black and white. And it's sort of showing you what we're able to see. And you can see where the patterns are very wide, we're able to see quite well. And then as the patterns get closer and closer together, it's more difficult to resolve those details. So in the laboratory, um, we did a very simple uh, type of acuity chart where we had an acuity chart that would get lighter and lighter and lighter. And we can just measure your acuity across each of these contrasts. This is what I mean by contrast, high contrast all the way to low contrast. Okay, and so here we've plotted um, our individuals who've had monocular enucleation in black, and you can see they're all across here, across the top. Then we have our binocular controls, so viewing with both eyes open in blue, and you can see that their ability overlaps with that of individuals seeing with only one eye after unilateral eye enucleation. And you can see that sort of at this mid-level contrast, individuals who have had uh, monocular nucleation are actually seeing better than individuals who have uh, binocular vision seeing with two eyes. And then you can see the green here. This is our binocular controls viewing monocularly with an eye patch over one eye and uh, just viewing with the one eye. And they're not viewing as seeing as well as individuals with eye enucleation. And so you can see that low contrast letter acuity in people with uh, eye enucleation is really excellent. So to summarize, acuity and sensitivity to contrast is excellent. And as I showed you, it's actually somewhat better than controls viewing with one eye, even at low contrast. So then in our lab, we asked, how is it that adults are able to see so well? So what has happened to the development of the brain? Because the brain is what really supports vision. The eye is really the sensor that brings the information into the brain. And the brain is what interprets the information. So has it changed after eye enucleation? So I'm just showing you a schematic of what the visual brain looks like. Here are the two eyes. And you can see that there, um, the optic nerves have half of them go to the same side of the brain and the other half cross over to the opposite side of the brain. There's this subcortical region called the lateral geniculate, geniculate nucleus that the optic nerve first stops at and then information travels to the back of the head into the occipital cortex which is also known as the visual cortex and that's where vision first happens. So let's look at what, would what the brain would look like if you were to enucleate one eye. So you can see that you're losing half of the input to the visual system with eye enucleation. So we did a study with magnetic resonance imaging or MRI and you can see this is just a a picture of uh, the back of a brain. Imagine that you were looking at the back through the back of my head. And then we zoomed in on this region of the brain because we wanted to look at the lateral geniculate nucleus. And so we zoom in very close and then we traced out this region here. And this is the right LGN and the left LGN. Okay, the interesting thing I'm briefly going to say about this structure that is subcortical called the LGN is that each, uh, it has several layers and the eyes connect with each of the different layers separately. So our prediction was that if you were to enucleate one eye, that you would disconnect 
three of the six layers and that those cells might just no longer function and would probably atrophy over time. So here I'm showing you the volume. We measured how big the LGN was. And these are our controls. And I'm just showing you um, the left and right hemisphere. And here are, are our individuals who underwent monocular enucleation. And you can see that the volume of the LGN as expected is somewhat smaller because as we expected, some of those cells may have just not been used. And so they eventually sometimes atrophy. But the interesting thing is that it's actually larger than one would expect. It's not half the volume of the controls. It's actually larger. And it's even larger than expected in the hemisphere that is opposite the remaining seeing eye. And we know that that hemisphere develops earlier than the other hemisphere. So our thought is that some of these cells may have been taken over by the remaining eye and, and that there may be more brain structure that's supporting the remaining eye. And lastly, I'll just show you a slide that sh uh, shows you where we looked at the cortex, which is um, at the back of the brain, the visual part of the brain. And if you look at this, it's probably a better representation in this picture here. You can see that there's actually more surface area in the visual cortex of individuals who have had monocular nucleation compared to controls. And when we look at measure the surface area, you can see that it's larger in individuals with monocular nucleation compared to controls. So it looks like when I put it all together, vision following long-term loss of one eye, despite the loss of the eye and of half of the input to the visual system, visual function is really quite good, quite intact. And I've shown you that there are some measurable adaptations in the brain, both in the LGN at a subcortical level and also at cortical levels. And I acknowledge my funders who helped uh, support all of this research and my wonderful collaborators who made all of this research happen. And I would like to say thank you to all of the patients who have participated in our research over the years. And it's been really fun seeing some of you here at this conference today. So I will end my presentation and we will move on to the next speaker um, who is Stefania Morrow. Um, so I'm going to continue on from uh, where Jen kind of left off with research in our lab um, and talk to you guys a little bit about uh, hearing following long-term monocular nucleation. So Daredevil, who's a superhero that's pictured, um, is a popular superhero who's blind. And as a result, his remaining senses function with superhuman accuracy and sensitivity. And this gives him abilities far beyond the limits of a sighted person and includes super sensitive touch and hearing. So we're wondering, do enhanced abilities in the remaining senses also exist for blind people outside of the Marvel universe? And research has shown that um, in the complete loss of vi vision, other sensory systems are able to adapt and compensate. Um, so for example, um, people with complete blindness, there's evidence that they're better at identifying the location of a sound. Um, and there's also uh, been evidence for activation of visual areas of the brain um, for sound. So what happens to other senses after only one eye is enucleated? Is hearing altered after eye enucleation? And are other senses enhanced to make up for this reduction in vision? So um, in our lab, in Jen's lab, um, we've looked at auditory and audiovisual outcomes following monocular nucleation. Um, and this includes sound localization, audiovisual processing, um, and we specifically focus on audiovisual illusions, um, the integration of vision and hearing, as well as face, voice, and ob object perception, and uh, auditory brain structure and function. In my talk today, I'll uh, be presenting some research that's focused on these three main areas, um, sound localization, um, audiovisual processing, specifically for illusions, and auditory brain structure. 
So uh, similar to um, what Jen told everyone, um, our research uh, examines comparing um, participants who have had one eye removed um, and all the data I'll show you there uh, outlined in red um, compared to binocular viewing controls uh, who will be in like a greenish teal color and binocular viewing controls who are viewing with an eye patch. So uh, we call them monocular viewing controls. So to study uh, hearing in people with monocular nucleation, our lab investigated sound localization. Um, and we were interested in finding out whether people who had an eye removed were better at identifying where sound was coming from um, compared to binocular viewing participants, similar to people um, who are completely blind. Um, so participants were placed in a soundproof booth and they were surrounded by an array of speakers uh, ranging in a position from 90, deg 90 degrees to their, from their left to their right. Um, so in this slide here, that's uh, the schematic that we've shown, the different speakers that were positioned kind of in a, a semicircle around the participants. Um, and each participant was asked to identify the where the location of the sound was coming from, from each of the speakers. So here are the results for the study. Um, so the vertical axis plots the mean error, um, which is the perceived location of the sound minus the actual location of the sound. So that horizontal line that's at zero is um, close to uh, perfect um, localization. So the closer to zero horizontal line, the better. Um, and the horizontal axis plots the actual speaker location. So um, these circles that are plotted are the circles for the binocular viewing controls. And you can see that um, they perform better when the speaker's closer to straight ahead and then get um, a little less accurate as the speakers move outwards. Um, and here I'll overlay the data for our nucleated participants. Um, the monocular nucleated group performs significantly more accurately with less overall localization errors. Um, so uh, they had more accurate sound localization. Um, so I'll move on to the next part, which is um, an audiovisual illusion called the McGurk effect. So um, instead of discussing um, research related to only hearing, we're now starting to move towards putting hearing and seeing together. Um, so in general, the accurate perception of speech is influenced by audiovisual integration or how the brain combines auditory and visual information that is presented to someone at the same time. Um, so speech information is greatly enhanced um, by the observation of visual lip movements as well as what you are hearing. Um, so an auditory syllable is uh, so the McGurk effect, I should tell you, um, is when an auditory syllable is perceived differently depending on whether it's paired with a speaker who's pronouncing the same or a different syllable. Um, so for example, if you hear a speaker saying ba, but you see them lipping the um, word ga, Typically, that is put together um, as a completely different percept, which a lot of people will hear as da or tha or something completely different. Um, so on the following slide, I'm going to show you a demonstration of the McGurk effect. Um, so it might play as soon as I switch the slides. So um, for uh, I'll play it a few times, um, but in general, if you can uh, keep your eyes and look directly at the speaker, keep your eyes open um, and we'll do it a few times so you can see if you can perceive any differences. Yeah. All right, so I'll play this a few times. So keep your um, eyes and ears open and uh, see what you perceive her to be saying. All right, now I'll ask everyone to close your eyes. So typically, um, when during the first presentation, people hear 
uh, da or tha or something similar. But when um, you're asked to keep your eyes closed, you hear very clearly that she's saying ba. So um, here are the results from the study. Um, so this, I've broken down the possible responses. So participants were able to select ba, ga, or da during these types of uh, presentations. And um, looking specifically at da responses, we can see that the enucleated group um, uh, perceived da less frequently than both of the binocular viewing and the patch viewing control groups, and instead perceived ga more often. Um, and in general, both of the control groups perceived um, the illusory da effect um, compared to either of the two other choices. All right, and finally, um, have auditory parts of the brain adapted? So is brain structure altered in order to compensate for the partial loss of vision after monocular nucleation? Um, so here, uh, this is the same cartoon that Jen showed earlier, um, but instead of looking at the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, we're looking at the medial geniculate body, which is a subcortical auditory relay station and plays a central role in auditory processing. Um, so that's a little cartoon of where it would be located. Um, and here's the same uh, image of the brain and we'll just zoom in so I can show you where that would be located. Um, so very difficult to see. Um, so uh, using MRI, we uh, measure the volume of this brain structure. Um, so here I've plotted the volume um, for the binocular viewing control group. And um, there was no difference in volume uh, for the left MGB compared to the right MGB. Um, and here's the results for the mon monocular nucleated group where there was an increase in volume for the left MGB compared to the right. So there was an asymmetry that was present um, in this group, but not for controls. Um, and this, uh, it didn't matter which eye was removed. It wasn't related to eye removal. Um, it was uh, just a general pattern that was seen throughout. So to wrap it up, because I think I'm running out of time, um, we have observed adaptive changes in hearing, um, specifically in sound localization. And um, moving forward, when hearing and vision come together, they're not processed the same following monocular nucleation. Um, as is evidenced by the McGurk effect. And these behavioral changes are reflected in changes in brain structure and function. Um, so thank you to uh, funding sources and to all the collaborators as well. Thank you so much, Stefania. Um, we'll move on to Esther Gonzalez. Great, so today I'm going to talk about some adaptations to monocularity and low vision and some practical lessons from science. So here we go. Uh, vision is our most complex sense. Uh, over 32 areas of the brain have been found to have anything to do with vision. Of course, some of them are more important than others, but uh, monocular enucleation, as we have seen, improves some functions. Uh, leave some functions alone, no difference from uh, two wide uh, uh, observers, but it does decrease some functions. So I'm going to talk about four important areas that may show uh, a problem after monocular enucleation. First of all, our depth perception is reduced. Uh, there is a shift in visual direction towards the remaining eye, which means uh, our location in space may be affected. It reduces our field of view, and there is also the possibility for some people uh, of uh, having low vision as a consequence of treatment. So what can we do about it? Well, we can improve deaf perception by using motion parallax, but let's first uh, explain what binocular disparity is. Binocular disparity is a very important cue for depth that the brain uses. The fact that we have eyes on different parts of the head 
means that the brain gets two images that are slightly different from the world. The brain brings those two images together, computes the differences, and uh, computes depth, and is very good at doing that. When you have, well, uh, anyway, uh, uh, binocular disparities between, uh, behind uh, our 3D movies and stereoscopes and many other things. However, we can use instead of binocular disparity, motion parallax. Now, this is a demonstration of motion parallax. It's monocular, so please cover one eye if you have two eyes. And look at the tip of the finger and following, follow the movement with your head, not with your eyes. So move, close one eye, look at the tip of the finger and follow the hand and concentrate on the tree and see how the tree looks actually in 3D. Anyway, you have to move your head as, uh, and only use one eye. The interesting thing about monocular, uh, about uh, motion parallax, which is a monocular cue, is that it brings to the brain the same geometrical information that uh, binocular disparity brings. In the real world where you have many levels of depth, I'm going to give you an example of a child looking at a red crayon. Objects in front of that red crayon move faster, move, sorry, move more than objects behind that red crayon. And the brain calculates depth by using these cues eh, automatically. And it's a very powerful cue, so powerful that, for example, birds of prey use it. Uh, so this is a triple exposure photograph of a baby owl using both horizontal and vertical motion parallax in order to judge distance from its lunch accurately. Uh, it also uses binocular disparity. So in a study that we did, we found that children don't necessarily use uh, motion parallax. Perhaps we have trained our kids to just sit still and they shouldn't do that, they should move. Um, we then taught them to use motion parallax and they did brilliantly. So teach your children to move their head and use motion parallax. Why is depth perception useful? Well, certainly for managing stairs, activities of daily living, sports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This pretty much everything in life needs uh, accurate depth perception. Uh, another thing that happens with monocular nucleation is that our visual field is reduced. It's only 75% of the binocular field. So again, encourage children to make more head turns and eye movements in order to cover the whole visual field. So here it is, uh, Ernst Mach's uh, depiction of his left visual field. And you can see his mustache and his eyebrows, etc. Okay, another thing that happens uh, when we lose one eye is that the center of visual direction is shifted towards the remaining eye. So kids have to be made, be made aware of this so that they can correct their body's position. So uh, the uh, uh, midline uh, is now perceived closer to the viewing eye, to the remaining view eye. Viewing eye on average is 75% of the distance. Why is this useful? Well, we can blow birthday candles up accurately. <laughs> That's probably not particularly important. However, we will avoid bumping into obstacles, and even perhaps more importantly, for driving. Now, for some people, now that eyes are being saved, and that is wonderful news, there may be low vision as a consequence of treatment. Uh, scotomas are blind spots produced by uh, in this particular case, treatment to the retina. 
And uh, the most detrimental are central scotomas. Uh, they affect color vision and acuity. Now, scotomas can be absolute or relative. Absolute scotomas produce no vision and relative scotomas uh, show some residual vision. Why is central vision so important? Well, here is um, a picture a diagram of the eye. And right in the center of this normal left eye, there's this tiny area called the fovea. And this tiny area is used for perceiving fine detail and color. It's a very important part of the eye. However, as we move away from the fovea, acuity and color, contrasensitivity, uh, reduce. So this is an example of what happens as we move away from the fovea. So this is a normal left eye. And look at what happens if suddenly we have central vision loss that is, uh, that forces us to see, uh, to, to look five degrees away from the fovea. Well, our acuity goes down to 40% of what it is if we used central vision. Now, central or foveal vision is used for reading, and that is a very important visual function. Peripheral vision is also important. It affects our orientation in space, but children should be encouraged to be active. And we should remember that every person is different and each person's treatment is going to be different. So people move their eyes until the image of what they want to see falls on healthy retina. But do we know what our scotomas are and how they affect us? Okay, what I'm going to show you now is a demonstration of what happens to reading after central vision loss. And this person's eyes are moving all over the place, but she is unaware of what's happening. So she's trying to read Moby Dick. And this is the first sentence of Moby Dick. Whoops, it disappeared. Oops, only part of it. Hmm. Oh dear. Hmm. Okay, again, there is. Oh, it's gone. It's gone. Okay, so this person is unaware of what happens. Things just appear and disappear. Now, this gentleman has bilateral central vision loss. And he says he's looking straight ahead of the camera, but he's not, he's actually looking up. The area of the retina that we choose in order to see something when we, when we lose central vision is called the preferred retinal locus or PRL. I'm showing you here a right eye with a huge scotoma in the center. If the PRL is PRL is to the left of the scotoma. Well, we cannot read because the sentence falls right on the scotoma. If it's to the right of the scotoma, well, it's a problem because the sentence will be obscured by the physiological blind spot, which we all have. If it's below the scotoma, we can read because there's healthy vision, uh, vision there. But the best PRL for reading is above the scotoma because that is also very good for walking emulation. Now, the PRL can be trained and you can use very sophisticated equipment such as microparameters, computers, eye trackers, or as simple as paper and pencil, but it requires a lot of work, a lot of patience. Unfortunately, most of the research on low vision training has been done with adults. Where's the best PRL? Well, it depends on many factors. It depends on the scotoma number, size, shape, location, the activity to perform the viewing condition and whether other structures of the eye have been affected by treatment. If the scotomas are in the far periphery, they're usually not a problem at all. So rehabilitation should be tailored to the individual's needs. So I'm preaching to the converter, converted because you all know that low vision rehabilitation requires a partnership between doctors, occupational therapists or other rehabilitation professionals, parents, and of course, the children. And I'll leave you with this thought and thank you very much. 
Wonderful, thank you so much, Esther. Let's uh, move on to hear from Sarah Johnson and her experience as a survivor. Thank you, Jen, for the introduction. All right, so as Jen has indicated, I am participating in the panel today as a survivor and um, someone with lived experience of retinoblastoma. In choosing my title for today, I've decided to call this presentation Visible and Invisible based on some of my thoughts reflecting on my own experience in terms of how retinoblastoma treatment in my early childhood affected my um, sort of relationship with the outer world. And so I'm very happy to be here to have the chance to share that with you today. And before I start, I just wanna acknowledge and thank the organizers for all of their work putting this together. And I'm so happy to be here in the panel uh, with a bunch of scientists since I am one and also to offer this sort of personal perspective on the same questions that these researchers have highlighted. So in my first slide here, I wanted to include a photo of myself as a child, since for all of us, um, as survivors, we know that retinoblastoma is very centered in this early life experience. So this is me running down the street where I grew up in Ottawa, Ontario. And just to introduce myself and a little bit about how I came to know that I had retinoblastoma and what my treatment experience was like. I was born in Kitchener-Waterloo in Canada, which is a little bit um, south of Toronto. And when my parents started to notice some of the classic signs of early development of retinoblastoma, I was taken to Toronto and treated at SickKids by Dr. Galley. Um, my left eye was enucleated when I was 11 months old, and then I underwent chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And this was back in the early 80s, as I'm now in my late 30s. Uh, since then, I was um, completely cured of disease and I went through my childhood and adolescence and early adulthood without any cancer, I'm very happy to say. And in terms of vision loss, I was actually very fortunate to only lose my left eye, but to maintain full vision in my right eye. And so it's funny when Jen um, sent me an email and asked if I would be interested in speaking today in the session, my first response was, well, I don't really have any experience with vision loss. And I think that really, that statement really is the foundation for what I've come to think of that I wanted to share today. And that's on the one hand through coping strategies, through things that my parents instilled in me when I was very young. And then also in um, just practicalities and adopting some of the techniques that I think Esther has highlighted in her talk. And I noticed a question popped up asking if RB patients would be willing to share these perspectives and if they had actually used some of these strategies. And I can say that, yes, I, I do catch myself doing these things even still. Um, so on the one hand, I don't think that I really felt deeply that I was impacted in my vision and my ability to use that sense as I was learning in school, as I was developing as a human being. But then on the other hand, I think that as I started to contemplate that question further, losing an eye is a very um, profound experience that can have effects not only at the physical and sensory level. Um, and the first thing I wanted to talk about as an example is how the brain can adapt to that and how I felt my own brain has perhaps changed and compensated over my lifetime to give me more acute sensory experience through other channels, that there are also uh, very personal things in the psyche and in the spirit that come with losing one or two eyes or with vision. And so I wanted to also offer that perspective at the end. So my second slide here is another picture of myself. Uh, and as you can see, I'm dressed, or you may be able to see, I'm dressed as a cat. And in fact, this brown bodysuit that I'm wearing that's got white furry polka dots, I'm actually dressed as a pussy willow. And this was the first um, dance performance that I participated in. I've just advanced to another photograph of myself. And this is my first appearance on the stage. 
as a kid, I was desperate to participate in dance lessons. And I would beg my mom after watching, I remember for any other Canadians in the audience, watching the elephant show with Sharon Lois and Bram as a kid in the eighties. And there was one episode in particular where they visited the National Ballet School in Toronto. And I was just riveted by this ballerinas learning to do exercises in the studio. It was very romantic and exciting to me. And I started dancing around the house and my mom um, recalls that I used to stand in front of the oven door and use that uh, reflective surface as a mirror so that I could see myself and admire my movements. And so before we relocated to Ottawa, I started taking dance classes at the University of Waterloo. And this was the performance that we had or the recital at the end of the year. And what I wanted to emphasize in this picture here is I'm standing with two other kids. One is on my left and one is on my right. And when I was learning how to dance and then also learning routines and how to integrate into this group of people who are moving through the choreography on stage, one thing that obviously um, impacted my ability to do so was that I couldn't really see from my left side. And so I was not always aware if other kids were standing to my left and how far I needed to be to be properly in certain formations. Um, but as you can possibly see in this photo, I'm centered pretty much between the two kids. And my mom likes to remind me from this experience of watching me performing on stage that the other kids were actually watching me to know what to do as opposed to me paying more attention to them to know what was going on. And so as a neuroscientist uh, now in my career and to kind of echo the things that Jen and Stefania talked about in their scientific presentations, one of the capacities of the brain um, that allows for us to kind of expand our sensory capabilities is referred to as plasticity. And this is something that I find really fascinating in my own work. The brain, if deprived of certain inputs or if um, things change across our lifespan, like for example, we lose our ability to remember things, the brain can actually compensate in um, remarkable extents and allow us to perform at a normal level or function uh, in a way that permits us to go about our daily lives. And so I think from an early age, this is an example where I had become conscious of the fact that I couldn't see from my left side and I'd use certain strategies, for example, using my head turns, um, motion parallax, as Esther was saying, to have a better sense of where I was in space and how I was relating to the other people on the street. And my mom also tells another story that, uh, that sticks out in this regard in which when we were traveling to Toronto for my regular appointments at SickKids and with Dr. Galley, my parents really wanted me to have positive experiences. And so we would often do a lot of fun things like go out to eat or go to the Royal Ontario Museum or go to the Ontario Science Center. And one year in particular at the Science Center, they had an exhibit on about sports. And as part of this, there was a lot of interactive um, displays where you could get up and sort of try uh, like swinging at a baseball. Uh, and they had one really nice exhibit in the open area where you could get on a balance beam and walk back and forth on the balance beam. And me being very keen to be physical and dance and be a gymnast, I hopped up there and one of the challenges that they gave us in that exhibit was to close our eyes and see how our ability to walk the balance being differed with the visual input as opposed to with our eyes closed. And I had no problem doing it in either situation. In fact, I found it, I mean, I don't remember this personally, but my mom tells me that she was just terrified, but also uh, in admiration of how I could walk back and forth along that balance beam with my eyes closed. And this could perhaps reflect that my proprioception or my ability to feel where my body was in space had evolved and compensated a little bit for my loss of vision in my left eye. And so I also included a couple of pictures here. I've, I went on to be in a like sort of kids dance company when we moved to Ottawa. And here's me in a performance with a bunch of other kids. And you can see that I'm perfectly positioned across the stage. And I went on to, to do a lot of performing in my teens. So before I run out of time, I wanted to share the other side of this experience, which is more along the lines of 
invisible uh, disability. And that's a term I've come to think about a little bit more in my adult life as opposed to in my childhood. And it's particularly been brought to the front of my mind as I make transitions, choosing an academic career path. I've had to move to different cities a number of times and get familiar with new cities, meet a lot of new people, um, interview for positions and be faced with rooms full of strangers and individuals who I have to quickly develop a relationship with. And one of the things that I have found myself doing is assuring people that I can interact with them in a quote unquote normal way because I've realized that my retinoblastoma treatment and the loss of my left eye has impacted the way that I look to the rest of the world. I have both consciously and unconsciously developed, um, I guess, ways of breaking down the walls or assuring strangers that I can see them and that I have um, intact intellectual function and that I can perform um, the duties of my job or uh, interact with them in a way that is exactly enough to be present. And so I think that um, losing an eye has sort of shaped the way that I navigate the world. And when I think about this concept of invisible work, I just want to acknowledge before I close out and say thank you that this actually takes a great deal of work. And for many of us as retinoblastoma survivors, we may not become conscious of it until we get a little bit older um, and are faced with the challenges of navigating the world on our own. And it's not until more recently when I've been faced with having a second cancer diagnosis and having my energy levels and my reserves tapped that I realize how much work it actually takes to maintain these strategies and ways of interfacing with people, constantly checking and being very conscious of who's around me that I'm not bumping into people on the sidewalk or at risk of being hit by a bike that's driving down the street or adjusting the angle of my face when I greet people who I'm meeting for the first time so that they know, yes, I can see them. Um, and even now during COVID wearing masks all the time, I've become more conscious of the signals that we send to others with our eyes. Um, being unable to show facial expressions has made me more conscious of my inability to, to cue people with my eyes. And that there have been other reactions that people have given me that remind me of this. And when you feel depleted, it does take a lot of extra work to do those things. So I think that's one thing that we may all continue to struggle with until later in our lives. So with that, I uh, wanna say thank you again. If any of you have questions, please don't hesitate to drop them in the Q&A. And I look forward to meeting some of you and seeing you again in the networking session later today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your experience and your thoughts. That really is just wonderful for everybody to hear. And we will uh, close our panel with Michelle Ongaro, who is going to share his lived experience. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michelle Ongaro. Um, I am African of Kenyan nationality, born in Kenya, but uh, now I am in Uganda because of the COVID situation. Uh, but well, that is not important for now. Um, <clears throat> I was born with sight. Yes, and then um, um, a few months later, or let's say by, by the time I was two years, uh, both my eyes had been removed as a result of uh, retinoblastoma. So as a result, I have been blind since almost all my life. Um, and initially I didn't really no, sometimes that's the advantage of being a child because you do not really understand fully 
the, impl the implications of, 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 of what you found yourself into. So I tried to live like a normal child, but it became difficult because, you know, you try to run without understanding the environment, you get into accidents, you fall, you knock people down, you hit things. And well, I grew up um, and then I came to, to understanding more my world and how I need to move around safely. Um, I went to school in Kenya. Uh, it was a school for blind people. So there were a bit of the material that we were supposed to, that we were to use for our learning, including Braille and other material. Then I finished school. Now I'm a musician. I am a multi-instrumentalist, singer, and music coach. And yeah, uh, I really don't know what to say much. I'll try to think as I go because I didn't prepare any notes because I'm, I'm not used to reading and preparing notes and I just speak as it comes. Um, hopefully I'll be able to make sense. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, implica the, 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 the situation is a bit different uh if you are if you grew up in what they call a developing economy or what it's described uh cruelly to me as the third world country because being in a third world country you know the infrastructure is not fully complete um the you know the infrastructure is, is is difficult for for the majority and it's more difficult for a blind person you know we we don't have all these all these little adjustments that you know the much more um the more developed countries have we do not have uh many of the laws that are there to you know to protect guard and you know uh help persons living with disabilities um and i must say most develop econo most developing economies are trying to catch up you know without the infrastructure, of course. And so that's one challenge. That's one uh, thing that uh, we, we are, uh, we experience a lot. Um, I've, I'm, I'm happy I've heard things about there's someone there who was, who, who, who has done dancing and which, which is really nice. Um, another thing is still in in in, uh, in in developing economies in 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 the so-called third world economies. Uh, still, there are so many unnecessary deaths. There are so many premature deaths as a result of retinoblastoma because of late diagnosis and. Oh, I've sounded scientific there. Yeah. Um, and as a result, a lot of us, I don't know how many people survived in my time, but um, well, I've, I, I also lost a child through retinoblastoma uh, 10 years ago. He was three. He was diagnosed with it. I think maybe it was a bit too late for us to do anything much. Plus, yeah, other issues that maybe 
will I'll, I'll address uh, I'll address them uh, one day when I have time. Um, well, I have one daughter who is fifteen. Oh, it's actually sixteen. Yeah, turning sixteen this year, this month, and she's okay. And um, after the the son died, uh, I have another son who is three, and he's never shown any signs of uh, of of of. of or symptoms of retinoblastoma. So, so far I'm happy. So, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to cope is never easy with, with, with living without sight. It's never easy um, because even people in develop, at least I have, I have traveled a bit. I've been to, I've been to I've been to Europe and I've been to countries where uh, the infrastructure is much more friendlier so I found it easier to move from one place to another and unlike in my country of birth it's a bit difficult because of the infrastructure and the way the, the, the way, the way things are at the moment, it's not easy, but I think by the by, by the fact that it's not it's it's it has its challenges, it also makes us a bit sharp so that we can we can manage to move around in those situations and try to uh, you know to. To be productive in, in 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 our societies, you know. I have, uh, well, as a musician and as a person living with a visual impairment, it is, you know, it's a very competitive market. You have to look for jobs. You have to look for, uh, you know, and you you need gadgets that will enable you to, to, be competitive. It's not easy, um, but you know we are trying. We, we, we never give up. I I am trying as much as possible. Um, all these gadgets that are that are there to help blind people to try to be competitive in the world are in many situations very expensive. You know uh, the software, the braille material, the braille machines. You know the 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 the, 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 the good computers with the good software, good um, screen readers. They are a bit expensive, and that becomes a challenge. But all the same, um, I'm still there, making music. Of course, we've had. Uh, COVID, which, which, which has made our industry, you know, pretty, uh, our industry was really hit hard, you know, and that's for everyone. Um, and many other industries were hit hard, uh, you know, the world economy uh, at large, and of course the entertainment and tourism industries in particular. Uh, but all the same, we are kicking. We are trying all our best we can do. Um, we still have to hope for a better tomorrow. I love to. I love being optimistic, despite all the situations, you know, because having survived retinoblastoma, which is a form of a cancer, uh, and having survived in uh, in a developing country where the rate of death as a result of cancers is, is, is very, very high because of late diagnosis, that gives me hope for a better tomorrow. It gives me, it gives me something to hold 
on to when things are tough that I survived cancer. I can survive other things which to me are smaller than what I've been through. Um, another thing is, you know, it's difficult sometimes dealing in, 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 in a societal situation because my experience with losing my child was, you know, there was the pain of loss and then there was there was the reality after the loss, you know. Uh, when I joined the when I joined the meeting today, I I I found uh, uh, Morgan talking about um, us being able to avoid things that we cannot control, and one of the things that is very very uh, what, one of the things that happens a lot in, in, in these situations is what is said in public, either because of lack of understanding or because of lack of knowledge or because of religious stroke spiritual beliefs and that, you know, you know, people would say uh, things like, be careful when you have this kind of person you know, uh, he he is a cancer survivor. He might infect you with cancer. I've had I've had those kinds of theories, which are not true. There are chances of there there are chances of your child inheriting. But the way people talk, it's like it's like you know you might infect your partner as well which is wrong, which is not true. And another thing is, uh, you know, uh, all these type things attached to, I don't know, scenes of your parents and scenes of your ancestors and which the, they say that's the reason as to why you have cancer or your child died of cancer. But anyway, I won't talk much. I was just here to share a little bit of my experience. Um, if you would like to, to hear the kind of noise I make, you can check my YouTube page. It's called Michelle Ongaro. And you can also follow me on Michelle Ongaro Music and know uh, what is happening in my music spheres. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, that really was wonderful. And I definitely will be checking out your YouTube channel and following you. Thank you, Jennifer. We received a, um, a number of questions, a few of which are very similar. So I might pose at least one of them to you as this is such an important part of our meeting. Um, so one of the questions that a few folks have asked that are, I think is likely directed to you or Stefania was, wanting to know if you might comment about people that have both eyes but have limited sight um, and poor central vision in one of their eyes if you have any research or evidence about um, people in that regard so so that actually really is esther's um area of research so she's done some research with um uh, people who have had some central vision loss, but typically more with age-related macular degeneration. So maybe Esther, you'll comment? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, most of the research in central vision loss uh, has been done with adults. Uh, it's usually uh, age-related macular degeneration, the, the main uh, cause of uh, central vision loss. Uh, very little has been done with children. And the reason is that there are indeed few children with central vision loss, uh, although do, they do exist. Uh, the principles, however, are the same. Um, training of a PRL, uh, making people aware of uh, their scotomas, um, mobility issues, uh, vision aids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Um, um, yes, uh, 
there, there is research and the principles apply to pretty much everyone. Uh, one interesting thing, people with central vision loss who are young, usually a Stargardt's disease, actually perform better than people who are older. So there is, this is an interesting thing. Youth is a wonderful thing. Thank you for that. Um, there's one last question that I'll share. I'm not sure if anyone would want to answer this or who would answer it, but um, the, the attendee has says, uh, they wanted to know if they were correct in their understanding that a good eye in a person um, who's been enucleated, so the person's remaining eye, is it true that that eye is more prone to injury compared to um, uh, someone who has both of their eyes, in which case there would be equal chance of either of those eyes being injured? So I think that might be a, more a, a question of mm -hmm. statistics. Um, so I think this is often why um, individuals who have had uh, eye enucleation will wear glasses to protect that uh, seeing eye. Um, so I, do, I don't think that it's necessarily more prone. I think it's more, you know, you just really don't want anything to happen to that seeing eye. Great. I think that's all the time we have for questions today, but thank you to all the panelists for their really engaging and thorough discussions.